Hello, language learners. It's Maddie here again from English with Maddie. And today I want to welcome you back to another book club video. Today we are going to be reading from the book Peter Pan. Now, many of you may already be familiar with this story. It has been made into many variations of movies and other books. It has inspired all sorts of things. There are plays and oh my gosh, so many different characters have come out of this story. So in some way or other, I'm sure you have heard of Peter Pan, the boy who never wanted to grow up. And of course, his group of lost boys and Wendy and everyone, the kids who went to visit Neverland and Tinkerbell, the fairy, Captain Hook, all of those characters I'm sure so many people are already familiar with. As I always say, reading something that you are familiar with is an amazing way to study another language. When your brain already comprehends the storyline, it is so much easier to understand and guess where the story is going, what new words might be when you come across something new. So it gives your brain a lot less work to do. So I definitely recommend reading Peter Pan. So let me read you chapter one. And before I start reading, I just wanted to mention, I will leave the words on the bottom of the screen here. And then as we go, you can read along with me or I will leave a link in the description box to the English with Maddie website where you can find and download chapter one as well as the rest of the novel. So let's get into the story. All children, except one, grow up. They soon know that they will grow up and the way Wendy knew was this. One day when she was two years old, she was playing in a garden and she plucked another flower and ran with it to her mother. I suppose she must have looked rather delightful for Mrs. Darling put her hand to her heart and cried, oh, why can't you remain like this forever? This was all that passed between them on the subject but henceforth, Wendy knew that she must grow up. You always know after you are two. Two is the beginning of the end. Of course, they lived at 14, their house number on their street. And until Wendy came, her mother was the chief one. She was a lovely lady with a romantic mind and such a sweet mocking mouth. Her romantic mind was like the tiny boxes, one within the other, that come from the puzzling east. However many you discover, there is always one more. And her sweet mocking mouth had one kiss on it that Wendy could never get, though there it was, perfectly conspicuous in the right-hand corner. The way Mr. Darling won her was this. The many gentlemen who had been boys when she was a girl discovered simultaneously that they loved her and they all ran to her house to propose to her except Mr. Darling, who took a cab and nipped in first. So he got her. He got all of her except the innermost box and the kiss. He never knew about the box and in time he gave up trying for the kiss. Wendy thought Napoleon could have got it, but I can picture him trying and then going off on a, in a passion, slamming the door. Mr. Darling used to boast to Wendy that her mother not only loved him, but respected him. He was one of those deep ones who knew about stocks and shares. Of course, no one really knows, but he quite seemed to know and he often said stocks were up and shares were down in a way that would have made any woman respect him. Mrs. Darling was married in white, and at first she kept the books perfectly, almost gleefully, as if it were a game, not so much as a Brussels sprout was missing. But by and by, whole cauliflowers dropped out, and instead of them, there were pictures of babies without faces. She drew them when she should have been totting up. 
They were Mrs. Darling's guesses. Wendy came first, then John, then Michael. For a week or two after Wendy came in, it was doubtful whether they would be able to keep her, as she was another mouth to feed. Mr. Darling was frightfully proud of her, but he was very honorable, and he sat on the edge of Mrs. Darling's bed, holding her hand and calculating expenses. Well, she looked at him imploringly. She wanted to risk it, come what might, but that was not his way. His way was with a pencil and a piece of paper. And if she confused him with suggestions, he had to begin at the beginning again. Now don't interrupt, he would beg of her. I have one pound 17 here and two and six at the office. I can cut off my coffee at the office, say 10 shillings, making two, nine and six. And with your 18 and three, makes three, nine, seven and five, not, not in my checkbook makes eight, nine, seven. Who is that moving eight, nine, seven dot carry seven? Don't speak my own and the pound you lent to the man who came to the door quiet child dot and carry carry the child there you've done it did i say nine nine seven yes i said nine nine seven the question is can we try it for a year on nine nine seven of course we can george she cried but she was prejudiced in wendy's favor and he was really the grander character of the two remember mums he warned her almost threateningly and off he went again Mumps, one pound, that is what I have put down, but I dare say it'll be more like 30 shillings. Don't speak. Measles, one five. German measles, half a guinea, makes two fifteen six. Don't waggle your finger. Whooping cough, say 15 shillings. And so on it went. And it added up differently each time. But at last, Wendy just got through. With mumps reduced to 12 six and two kinds of measles treated at once. There was the same excitement over John and Michael had even a narrower squeak, but both were kept and soon you might have seen the three of them going in a row to Miss Folsom's kindergarten school accompanied by their nurse. Mrs. Darling loved to have everything just so and Mr. Darling had a passion for being exactly like his neighbors. So of course they had a nurse. As they were poor, owing to a, the amount of milk the children drank, the nurse was a prim Newfoundland dog called Nana, who had belonged to no one in particular until the darlings engaged her. She had always thought children important, however, and the darlings had become acquainted with her in Kensington Gardens, where she spent most of her spare time peeping into perambulators, which was much hated by careless nursemaids whom she followed to their homes and complained to their mistresses. She proved to be quite a treasure of a nurse. How thorough she was at bath time. And up at any moment of the night, if one of her charges made the slightest cry. Of course, her kennel was in the nursery. She had a genius for knowing when a cough is a thing to have no patience and when it needs stocking around your throat. She believed to her last day in old-fashioned remedies like rhubarb leaf and made sounds of contempt over all this newfangled talk about germs and so on. It was a lesson in propriety to see her escort, escorting the children to school, walking sedately by their side when they were well behaved, but butting them back into line if they strayed. On John's footer, in England, soccer is called football, footer for short, days he never once forgot his sweater and she usually carried an umbrella in her mouth in case of rain. There is a room in the basement of Mrs. Folsom's school where the nurses wait. They sat on forms while Nana laid on the floor, but that was only difference. They affected to ignore her as of an inferior social status to themselves and she despised their light talk. She resented visits to the nursery from Mrs. Darling's friends, but if they did come, she whipped off Michael's pinafore and put him into one with blue braiding and smoothed out Wendy and made a dash of John's hair. No nursery could possibly have been conducted more correctly and Mr. Darling knew it, yet he sometimes wondered uneasily whether the neighbors talked. 
he had his position in the city to consider. Nana also troubled him in another way. He had sometimes a feeling that she did not admire him. I know she admires you tremendously, George, Mrs. Darling would assure him, and then she would sign to the children to be specially nice to father. Lovely dances followed in which the only other servant, Liza, was sometimes allowed to join. Such a midget she looked in her long skirt and maid's cap, though she had sworn when engaged that she would never see 10 again. The gaiety of those romps and the gayest of all was Mrs. Darling, who would pirouette so wildly that all you could see of her was the kiss. And then, if you dashed at her, you might have got it. There was never a simpler, happier family until the coming of Peter Pan. Mrs. Darling first heard of Peter when she was tidying up her children's minds. It is a nightly custom of every good mother after her children are asleep to rummage in their minds and put things straight for next morning, repackaging into the proper places and many articles that have wandered during the day. If you could keep awake, but of course you can't, you would see your own mother doing this and you would find it very interesting to watch her. It is quite like tidying up drawers. You would see her on her knees, I would expect, lingering humorously over some of your contents, wondering where on earth you had picked this thing up, making discoveries sweet and not so sweet, pressing this into her cheek as if it were nice as a kitten, and hurriedly stowing that out of sight. When you wake in the morning, the naughtiness and evil passions of which you went to bed have been folded up small and placed at the bottom of your mind, and on the top, beautifully aired and spread out are your prettier thoughts, ready for you to put on. I don't know whether you have ever seen a map of a person's mind. Doctors sometimes draw maps of other parts of you, and your own map can become intensely interesting. But catch them trying to draw a map of a child's mind, which is not only confused, but keeps going round all the time. There are zigzag lines on it, just like your temperature on a card. And these are probably roads in the island, for the Neverland is always more or less an island, with astonishing splashes of color here and there, and coral reefs and rakish looking craft in the offing, and savages and lonely lairs, and gnomes who are mostly tailors, and caves through which rivers a river runs, and princes with six elder brothers and a hut, fast going to decay, and one very small old lady with a hooked nose. It would be an easy map if that were all, but there is also first day at school, religion, fathers, chocolate pudding day, getting into braces, say 99, three pence for pulling out your tooth yourself, and so on. And either these are part of the island or they are on another map showing through. And it is all rather confusing, especially as nothing will stand still. Of course, the Neverlands vary a good deal. John's, for instance, had a lagoon with flamingos flying over it, which John was shooting, while Michael, who was very small, had a flamingo with lagoons flying over it. John lived in a boat turned upside down on the sands, Michael in a wigwam, Wendy in a house with leaves deftly sewn together. John had no friends, Michael had friends at night, Wendy had a pet wolf forsaken by its parents, but on the whole, the Neverlands have a family resemblance, and if they stood still in a row, you could say of them that they have each other's nose and so forth. On these magic shores, Children at play are forever beaching their coracles, a simple boat. We have been there. We can still hear the sound of the surf, though we shall land no more. Of all delectable islands, the Neverland is the snuggest and most compact, not large and sprawly, you know. With tedious distances between one adventure and another, but nicely crammed. When you play at it by day with the chairs and tablecloth, it is not in the least alarming. But in the two minutes before you go to sleep, it becomes very real. 
That is why there are nightlights. Occasionally, in her travels through her children's minds, Mrs. Darling found things she could not understand, and of these, quite the most perplexing was the word Peter. She knew of no Peter, and yet he was here and there in John and Michael's minds while Wendy's began to be sprawled all over with him. The names stood out in bolder letters than any of the other words, and as Mrs. Darling gazed, she felt she had an oddly cocky appearance. Yes, he is rather cocky, Wendy admitted with regret. Her mother had been questioning her. But who is he, my pet? He is Peter Pan, you know, mother. At first, Mrs. Darling did not know, but after thinking back into her childhood, she just remembered a Peter Pan who was said to live with the fairies. There were odd stories about him, as that when children died, he went part of the way with them so that they should not be frightened. She had believed in him at the time, but now she was married and full of sense and quite doubted whether there was any such person. All right, you guys, because this story, this first chapter is quite long, I am going to stop reading here for today. There are still a couple pages left in chapter one of Peter Pan. If that was interesting to you, this setup into the children's minds and how they are interacting with Peter Pan in their own world and how their mother is finding out about it. I definitely recommend continuing on to read chapter one and even the rest of the book of Peter Pan. As I mentioned, chapter one as well as the rest of the book are things that you can find if you click the description below and head over to the English with Maddie website and check out the entire book and download it yourself. I hope you enjoyed this read aloud today. I hope you were able to learn something, practice your listening skills, or expand your vocabulary. Of course, you can always let me know if you would like me to continue reading any book in particular or if there are any books you would like to suggest for me to read. I love hearing from you guys in the comments. Thank you so so much for watching this video. If you haven't already, please subscribe so you don't miss any future English with Maddie videos and I hope to see you again soon both on my book club series here and on the other series in my channel. All right, guys, until next time, happy studying.